I'm Mark Lemley. I'm a professor of law at Stanford Law School and a partner at Dury Tongri. I'm also the founder of Lex Machina, and you're listening to IP Fridays. Hello, and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. Welcome to episode 72 of IP Fridays. Today's interview guest is Mark Lemley, professor at Stanford University, and he will talk about the resilience of the patent system. But before we jump into this very interesting interview, we have our lovely uh, guest um, Trisha Volpe again on the show. And she will talk about the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things may conveniently connect all of your electronic devices, allowing you to easily share photos and watch what's happening inside your house while at work. But are your security and privacy being compromised? Trisha Volpe of Barnes & Thornburg has the story. The U.S. federal government believes the Internet of Things is impacting security and privacy and is now taking a large router and webcam company to court over alleged security flaws. According to CNET, in a lawsuit filed in U.S. federal court in San Francisco in early January, the Federal Trade Commission has accused D-Link of poor security practices for its routers, web cameras, baby monitors, and other products, allegedly leaving consumers vulnerable to hacking. The FTC alleges, for example, that D-Link coded easy-to-crack login credentials into its camera software, making it easy for hackers to spy. According to the complaint, D-Link failed to oversee handling of security keys, leading to the exposure of a private key on a public website for about six months. The FTC alleges that D-Link was aware of consumers' concerns about keeping networks secure and promised advanced security. In a statement, D Link said it would fight the FTC's lawsuit and calls the FTC's charges unwarranted and baseless. D Link accuses the FTC of making vague and unsubstantiated allegations related to routers and IP cameras, but not alleging any breach of any product sold by D Link Systems in the U.S. Reporting for IP Fridays, I'm Trisha Volpe. Thank you, Trisha. And now we jump into the interview with Mark Lemley. I am very excited to be joined by Mark Lemley today. If you don't know who Mark Lemley is, he is the William H. Newcomb Professor at Stanford Law School. He's also the founder of Lex Machina, and he's founding partner of Dury Tangri. Thank you for being on the show, Mark. Thank you. Um, you've just written an interesting article, The Surprising Resilience of the Patent System, in the Texas Law Review. Um, I will post a link in the description. Why is the resilience of the patent system surprising to you? Well, uh, the answer is in part that we've had a lot of changes in the patent system in the United States in the last 40 years that sure seem to those of us who are patent lawyers like they're very significant. For 20 years from the 1980s through the mid-2000s, we did a number of things that strengthened the patent system. Um, some of us uh, worried that we were strengthening it too much, that we were going to interfere with innovation by giving too strong rights uh, to initial inventors. And then starting about 10 years ago, the pendulum started to swing back in the opposite direction, uh, and courts and Congress started cutting back in various respects on patent rights. And that's led to a new set of people worrying that we're going too far in the opposite direction, that we're going to interfere with innovation by weakening patent rights too much. What I show in the paper is that during both of those periods, the patent system just kept chugging along uh, in ways that don't seem related to either the strengthening or the weakening of the legal rights. Uh, when you look at how many patent applications are filed, at how many patents issue, at how many lawsuits are filed, at the win rate of those lawsuits, or at the, uh, what, we, what we know of the market for, for patent transactions, 
there are variations in each of those measures, but none of them seem to follow the stories that patent lawyers tell in which stronger IP rights lead to more patents or more lawsuits or more transactions and weaker IP rights lead to fewer patents or fewer lawsuits or fewer transactions. And that to me is very surprising. Right. Okay. Um, and um, we, we already just uh, you briefly summarized that, but um, what are the, it's a really long paper that you wrote, a really long article. <laughs> um, and um, what would be like the, the condensed summary, like what would be the most important findings from your article? Well, so, I mean, I think the, so the, the really interesting finding is, right, that, that the system doesn't seem much affected by the changes that we've made to patent law in either direction. And the question then becomes, why is that? And, you know, there are a number of possible explanations. I go through in the paper and discount some of the more obvious ones, uh, like, well, maybe it's just a function of, of broader macroeconomic conditions or changes in investment and research and development. Those don't seem to be explaining trends either. Um, one possible answer is that while it feels to those of us inside the system like we're making major changes to the patent system, maybe in the broader perspective, they're not actually all that big. Uh, and so one of the reasons that I call this the surprising resilience of the patent system is that it may be that we can move things around in the patent system with a fair degree of freedom without breaking it, either by making it too strong or by making it too weak. But the other thing I think to draw from the paper is the, is the possibility that the reasons people are getting patents and even the reasons people are filing patent lawsuits don't actually have all that much to do with the outcome of a patent case. Uh, that uh, people want patents for a variety of reasons related to uh, business work, related to uh, personal vanity, related to the ability to engage in sort of trading, related to freedom to operate, related to their venture capital fundraising. And none of those actually depend very much on whether at the end of the day I could enforce that patent in court. And even for litigation, a large percentage of the lawsuits filed in the United States are cases in which the plaintiff can get something out of the lawsuit whether or not they win. They are pharmaceutical and cases where just the filing of the lawsuit keeps the generic off the market, or they are nuisance value patent troll cases where the threat of putting the defendant to substantial litigation costs induces them to settle, or they are bullying cases where a larger competitor can impose costs on a rival uh, by, uh, by suing them around the time of their financing or uh, uh, just trying to mess with their competitor relationships, consumer relationships. And so it may be that the patent system has taken on a life of its own, And it's not particularly driven by whether or not we're likely to, render, uh, to rule that particular patents are obvious uh, or how we define infringement uh, or even uh, what kind of damages rules we have. Right. Um, your, um, the paper is full of numbers and charts and, and statistics and so on. And I'm, I'm really a big fan of statistics. <laughs> and I, I must say, I disagree a little bit with, with you. Um, say, you say that the numbers really were quite constant but, uh, or, or not really affected by the, the changes in the, the system. What, what I feel is that the, um, the litigation cases really went up um, like after 2005 or something and now they are a little bit more like uh, on the same level or even decreasing again um, can you can you uh, tell me what you think about that like uh, why, why did the numbers go up so steeply basically in the last couple of like in the last decade or so right so um, I so I, I think it's uh, to, to be clear what I'm claiming is not that there's no change it's that the changes don't seem correlated in an obvious way with the changes we've made to the patent law. All so right. it is right that the number of lawsuits went up in the late 2000s quite substantially. 
And in particular, if you break the numbers out, the number of defendants sued by patent trolls went up substantially in the late 2000s. Now, that's interesting because it's precisely at the time at which we'd sort of turned the corner and had been weakening the patent system in ways that people worried would make enforcement harder. We had the eBay case in 2006. We had the case that restricted willfulness in 2007. We made it easier to file declaratory judgment cases in 2008. And yet the the sort of number of lawsuits uh, filed uh, uh, continued to go up. You then have a special change in 2011 where we changed the way we count. You used to be able to file suit against 40 defendants in a single case. After the passage of the AIA, you largely had to file 40 different lawsuits if you wanted to do that. So we see an artificial jump in the number of lawsuits in 2011, but roughly a continuation in the number of defendants sued at that time. And then in the last several years, we have seen fluctuations. So uh, 2012 was the largest number of lawsuits ever until 2013. That was the largest number of lawsuits ever. 2014, it dropped by about 20 percent. And everyone said, oh, well, that's it. It's over. Alice has been decided, you know, we're, we're going to see a collapse in the number of lawsuits. Then it shot back up and 2015 was the most lawsuits ever filed in history. And then it fell uh, from that height in 2016. But I think if you look at the kind of broader trend over the last several years, it's not a peak and then a drop. It's kind of a a kind of fluctuation that maybe seems to even out. And we don't know what's going to happen in the next several years. Maybe that will continue to decline. Although one interesting data point that just came out this week uh, from the Patexia folks is that the number of unique patents enforced in court was essentially flat between 2015 and 2016. So while there were substantially fewer lawsuits filed, the same number of patents were being taken to court. There were just somewhat fewer defendants uh, for each of those cases. Okay, Mm -hmm. interesting. Um, So so what do you think are the most, you already just mentioned Alice, (laughs) but what do you think are the most important decisions or legislative changes that have led to the current present patent litigation situation? So I do think that Alice is a significant one if you're in the software or the biotech industries. Um, uh, if you're not in those industries, Alice essentially doesn't matter much to your to your life. But But patentable subject matter is a big change. That's something that 10 years ago was just a non-issue in US patent law and now is a very significant issue. Other changes I think that have made a difference in litigation One of them is the rise of IPRs in the wake of the America Invents Act. Now, that doesn't expressly change litigation. That is, it's mostly been something that's happened in addition to or on top of litigation. But it has meant that a number of uh, cases that would have otherwise proceeded through very expensive discovery and summary judgment get stayed pending the patent office's decision in the inter partes review. And in a fair percentage of those cases, the patent is invalidated. And so the litigation then doesn't proceed. The other change I think we've seen that's affected the business of patent litigation is that courts, both on Alice grounds, but also on other grounds, have proven more willing to grant motions to dismiss to throw cases out early. And that has meant that a business model that is premised on the fact that my filing a lawsuit against you will cost you several million dollars in litigation and several years of uncertainty is no longer true. Uh, So someone who might have paid $500,000 to settle a lawsuit, even if they were confident that they would ultimately win because they knew they'd pay their lawyers more than that, might instead take a chance on a motion to dismiss on Alice grounds or a motion to dismiss the complaint under Twombly and Iqbal and sometimes at least knock the case out for $50,000 rather than a couple million. The one thing I'll note, which is not a specific, it is not yet a legislative or judicial change, but, but might be one soon. The Supreme Court has taken review of the T.C. Heartland case concerning where it is permissible to file a patent lawsuit. Right now, you can file a lawsuit in pretty much any district in the country. 
and half of all patent lawsuits and the overwhelming majority of patent troll lawsuits are filed in the Eastern District of Texas. If, as I suspect is likely, the Supreme Court cuts back on patent venue, reads the statute more narrowly, most of those Eastern District of Texas lawsuits will go away. Not all, but, but most. And patent cases will end up in Delaware, in California, in New Jersey, in Virginia, in places where there are sort of actual technology concentrations rather than wherever the plaintiff wants to, to file suit. And I think that may make a big difference as a practical matter for patent lawyers, uh, because the Eastern District of Texas has, in procedural ways, been very friendly to patent plaintiffs. Okay. Um, in your uh, paper, you are suggesting that uh, patent litigation is more or less useful in different industries. And you mentioned that in the beginning of the interview already. Um, while there are cases where a true innovative company is earning money with the technology that they developed and they want to enforce their patents against competitors. There are other cases where there is just bullying or regulatory gaming or you men already mentioned the nuisance value cases. Um, would you want to get rid of patent litigation? <laughs> you are suggesting something like this like in, in your paper. Well, I, I don't think we can get rid of patent litigation altogether, but, but we probably should take a closer look at whether patent litigation is actually serving useful social goals. So uh, to me, what do we want out of the patent system? We want people to invent, but we also want that invention to get into the hands of the public. Uh, and so that can happen in a variety of ways. The patent owner can invent something and then build it, uh, sell it to the world. That's the classic model. Even if the patent owner is a non-practicing entity, I think they can usefully uh, get their invention in the hands of the world by uh, licensing it uh, where their license involves real technology transfer, right? I go to someone who doesn't have my idea or doesn't know how to make it work, and I give them information that allows them to make it work, and they sell it. That's a socially productive thing to do. Uh, you can also transfer your invention in another way, which is that somebody might steal it from you. They might read your patent and copy it. They might uh, uh, meet with you and then decide to take it from you. I think we need patent litigation or the threat of patent litigation to prevent that from happening. We don't want that to happen. We want you to enter into a transaction instead. But if none of those things is true, if I don't make a product and I don't actually put the information that I came up with in the hands of anyone else, either by a license or indirectly because they copied or learned it from me, then I'm really just imposing a tax on people who independently invented the same thing and who did go out and, and provide it to the world. So I think we probably can be more restrictive in the sorts of patent lawsuits that are being used essentially to tax innovative companies rather than uh, to facilitate uh, uh, innovation and technology transfer by the, by the original inventor. Mm, okay. Um, in this uh, context, how do you see like intellectual ventures, new, new companies, spin-off companies that uh, do, are trying to do good in the world, let's say? <laughs> so I think, right, I think that's an example of a circumstance in which a non-practicing entity can be a socially constructive force, right? If, if Intellectual Ventures just goes, uh, goes out and buys up patents that no one used, no one read, and reads them against technology that's been out there for 10 years and says, hey, we can make some money by taxing those people, I don't think that's particularly valuable for the world. But if Intellectual Ventures says, you know what, we're going to employ a bunch of people to come up with ideas, and we're not a manufacturing company, but we're going to take those ideas and communicate them to people who can make use of them. We're going to license them. That is socially productive. That is something we want to do. Right. Um, in your paper, you're also proposing to make uh, patent litigation quicker and cheaper. And uh, as I am from Germany, 
Uh, in Germany, the average case, uh, case costs around like 100,000 euros or about 100,000 dollar, US dollars at the moment for the first instance, including all attorney fees and both of both sides and the court fees. Um, and the first instance is typically rendered within one year. Um, could that be an inspiration for the patent litigation system in the US? Uh, I think it could. Now, one difference, of course, is that in Germany, the validity issues are separated from the infringement issues. So you've got a separate cost of, of invalidity. And I think we've seen some steps in that direction with the existence of IPRs. But I personally think it's valuable to have the same court thinking both about validity and infringement because I agree. Of, often the scope of the patent is what matters. And so you don't want one party on either side to argue in one forum, well, this patent is very broad and in another forum, well, this patent is very narrow um, when it benefits them to do so. But that said, uh, a lot of the costs that we have in the United States, I think, come from discovery and our sort of pretrial litigation structure and really aren't necessary. Uh, that is a lot of the effort we spend and the money we spend in, uh, in pretrial litigation in the United States is probably wasted uh, and we could do it a lot more efficiently. Yes. Um, if people wanted to reach you for questions, what would be the best way to reach you? Uh, email is probably the best way to reach me, M Lemley, L-E-M-L-E-Y at law.stanford.edu. Great. Well, Mark, I know you have to run now for a lecture. <laughs> and it has been great that you uh, are, were able to uh, take this call and have the interview. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, happy to do it. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. We would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at ipfridays.com or on iTunes or Stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at ipfridays.com slash feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can go to ipfridays.com slash iTunes, and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast, or even have comments within the next episode, please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com slash voicemail. You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.